Dr. Bogosh, thank you so much for joining us on our health and wellness series. I think it's never been more important and more fitting than to speak to an infectious disease specialist as it is right now at this moment today. So much has gone on the last 24 hours, uh, so much to get to. But the first question that I have for you, where do you feel we are in terms of flattening the curve right now today? I mean, in, in Canada, I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, we certainly have seen cases plateau and even significantly decline in most parts of the country. Uh, there's provinces like uh, you know BC and Alberta who are who definitely flattened the curve and are seeing you know low numbers of cases per day. Alberta's having a few outbreaks here and there. Other places, for example, the Maritimes are doing fantastic as well. Uh, even Ontario, which was having trouble earlier on. It, you know, they were seeing anywhere from you know six to seven hundred new cases per day is now at around three to four hundred new cases per day so they're doing well and really the hot spots are Quebec and in particular Montreal and I would still say the greater Toronto area it, you know they're seeing about 60 percent of all the cases in Ontario so uh, those two metropolis settings are are kind of the hot spots in Canada but elsewhere I think the country's doing all right. So uh, it's been said that herd immunity is really the only option in, in getting over this. And so where do you see us getting there safely? So, I mean, herd immunity actually can refer to a few different things. One is that, you know, people get infected and hopefully they develop some form of immunity uh, and hopefully that lasts for a period of time. So that's, that's sort of one, we call that natural immunity. And then, you know, other, when we really talk about herd immunity, we're often talking about vaccination. And, you know, I, I really do see vaccination as the durable solution out of this, mm -hmm. out of this mess we're in. Because, you know, I don't think this virus is going to go anywhere anytime soon. And uh, certainly we know the devastating toll it can take, especially on people with underlying medical conditions or people who are over the age of 60. So, you know, uh, I think it's, it's great to see that there's just tremendous research going on to develop vaccines. There's over 90 different teams working on this front. And, uh, you know, people say it takes a long time to develop a vaccine. And they'd be right. But, you know, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before where there's truly unlimited brain power and unlimited resources being poured into this. So I think we're, I'm, I'm optimistic on this front. You know, some of these candidate vaccines are looking pretty good and they're pretty advanced. I mean, we're in phase two clinical trials for a couple of yeah. years. So that's, that's impressive. Incredible. It's actually incredible. So you're talking about the numbers in most, throughout the country mostly, are starting to decrease. So where do you feel we are going to be in the next month or so in regards to isolation and extreme measures? Because people are getting so many mixed messages. Uh, we had Dr. Fauci in the US yesterday saying that reopening uh, various parts of society too soon, it's way too soon. And then you have other specialists talking about how we are creating other problems, staying isolated you know we could talk about those problems in a moment but where do you see us in the next couple of months sorry. I... pardon me for one second i'm sorry yeah can you hear me now yeah okay i'm sorry it just cut off for one second yeah so my, my maybe you can, was, should, you can yeah. add that out. pardon me but I, I heard most of it and then it cut out for a sec so i apologize yeah. for that but so you know, i'm i'm going to ask you again how much okay. longer do you see us in isolation so i i'm sorry i can't hear you you cut it again can you hear me now now we can yeah. you're good you're good not sure. So we're gradually lifting the public health restrictions that we're living under. And certainly some parts of the country and certainly some parts of the world are further along than others as this epidemic has sort of taken its toll and the first wave has sort of petered out. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting, you know, in areas that are having low levels of transmission, I think it's completely reasonable for those areas to start to lift public health restrictions. But, you know, some places may be lifting their public health restrictions a little bit too soon. And, and obviously the risk in those settings is that you're just going to get a rebound of cases and end up where you were in the first place and, and, and really have to clamp down harder uh, with, with, the, with you know, more public health restrictions for a longer period of time. I don't know if there's any, you know, in the pre-vaccine era, I think it's going to be, it's going to be challenging. Uh, but certainly in many jurisdictions uh, where there's you know, a, a, a decreasing number of new cases per day, and this seems to be sustained over time, I think it is okay to slowly and cautiously lift these restrictions that people are living under. 
you know, I just think the communication has to be key where people are aware that, you know, even with some of the lifting of these public health measures, if there are an unacceptable number of new cases of COVID-19, we might need to regress a little bit and, and climb yeah. back down. So communication is key. We're asking people to give up a lot. You know, there's a lot of economic hardships and it certainly is disrupting everyone's day-to-day -day lives in a tremendous manner. But on the other hand, you know, look what happens when there aren't public health measures in place. I mean, the U.S. has seen, what, about 80,000 deaths in about yeah. two months? And that's with public health restrictions in place. So this could be a lot worse. So, you know, of yeah. course, it's balancing a tightrope. It really is balancing a tightrope here. I think, I think we've done a good job. I do. I think we've done a really good job. I think Canada is very different than the U.S. Um, and I, I believe through personal experience and research and speaking with people, that people were listening. They absolutely yeah. were listening. I mean, now Canada is, certainly, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so now I feel like it's the second half of that. And what we're seeing now is the massive effects of isolation and uh, what, what may be our next big health crisis, which of course, I know you're not a mental health expert, but it really is the next wave is what it's doing to uh, our mental health and particularly our children and our youth. And so that's what, and our teens. And that's why I was asking you about how much longer do you foresee as an ID uh, specialist, because our kids are having a very hard time and knowing that there isn't an end in sight for them, they're having even a harder time with that. So that's why I was asking you. Yeah, about, no, I completely yeah. agree. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of this is going to be compounded by, you know, other factors as well that are intimately related to this, like economic hardship uh, yes. and, uh, you know, uncertainty over the future and, you know, even things that just... A, a combination of things that are affecting and impacting our day-to-day -day life, impacted supply chains, like you name it. Yes. Our our day-to-day our -day life as we know it has, has changed significantly. Absolutely. And the sad thing is there's no clear timeline for mm -hmm. when things can and will go back to normal. And that's obviously taking a tremendous toll on, on mental health. And, you know, one of the concerns is, of course, there's the infectious disease concern of a second wave, which, you know, we're going to have one. It's just a matter of how bad is it going to be, depending on the measures we take to mitigate that. But of course, the, you know, the big concern is deaths of despair. And, you yes. know, are, what, what's going to happen with, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, lack of access to, uh, you know, uh, you know, so, uh, in, you know uh, social, you know, normal social behavior, uh, you know, concerned with drugs of abuse, concerns with alcoholism. I mean, th these are, th these are, you know, going to be tremendous. It's going to take a tremendous toll. And, and uh, Very you know, yeah, yeah. And economic hardships aren't going to help this whatsoever. So it's, it's going to be a tough few years ahead, I think. You know, you, you talk about sort of the two hotspots in Canada being the two major urban centers, Montreal and Toronto. We talk about uh, our kids, our teens, our youth, and that, summer's coming up and that they a lot of kids get out of town in the summer they go to um, overnight residential camps or various sports camps um, and that's teetering right now we don't know if our kids can do that we haven't had the okay yet from from government or we haven't been told no either but to me it would seem safer to allow them to go to a safe environment where they've been tested before right um, as opposed to letting them roam free in the city where they're not being supervised because parents have to get back to work. I so, don't know. Honestly, I, don't know. I think you could debate that. And you know, I, yeah. pros and cons of both, but like we know that kids, and let's say, I don't want to say kids and young adults, let's call it under yes. 18. We exactly. know that they can get infected. Absolutely. Now the younger people are, it's, it looks like people may be less susceptible to getting this infection. But they serve people, kids of all ages, you know, from zero to 18 can be infected. So that's point yeah. one. Point two is, you know, what is the role that ages zero to 18 are involved with transmitting the infection? You know, maybe the younger you are, the less likely you are to transmit the infection. Okay, maybe that's the case. We're not entirely yeah. sure, but that might be the case. But yeah. even if kids are less prone to getting infected and less likely to transmit infection, if you get a bunch of them together under one roof, you can certainly amplify this infection despite the inefficiencies of acquisition and transmission. 
And the concern in those settings, you know, why aren't we all going back to school? Why aren't they going to summer camp? The concerns in those settings are if you amplify that under, you know, one roof or in a summer camp or something like that, you know, these kids go home. They infect their parents. They're worse yet, they infect their grandparents or contribute to community spread. Now, of course, you know, is there any right or wrong answer here? That would be unfortunate. But, you know, having kids roam free and, and yeah, uh, you know, okay. there's certainly the possibility that, that transmission could, could, could occur that way. You know, I'm all for, you know, good parenting, common sense, yeah. and data-driven public policy. I'm not a betting person, but I would bet that at least until, at least through June, Let's yes. put it this way, because things change fast. It's May, at least through June, and I'd even speculate at least through July. I bet there's no summer camps. That's my okay. guess. That's yeah. my guess, uh, and I'm not basing this on any inside information. I'm just based on where we're at and, and what we know. That'd be my best guess for now. So Sweden took a completely different approach. What is your take on Sweden's approach? I mean, this boils down to value judgments. Sweden's getting pummeled. Right? Their, yeah. their death rate, when you compare it to uh, you know, comparable neighboring countries, is significantly worse. And you know, people have sort of been cherry picking data points that suit yeah. their personal beliefs <laughs> and using them. <laughs> I guess I should expand that. That's not just with Sweden, that's with everything. <laughs> everything. But especially with Sweden, that, that, that's, that's happening. And like, listen, I don't feel like I have a dog in this fight. You just want health and well-being for everybody. But like, if you take a step back and look at the 30,000 foot view, you know, their deaths are significantly worse than comparable neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. um, they did clamp down. People keep saying they did not uh, have public health measures. Of course they did. They had significant public health measures. They weren't as stringent as other places, but they certainly did have uh, some pretty significant public health measures. Um, and, you know, it, a lot of this boils down to value judgments, and I'm not saying what they did is okay or not okay. It's they collect, that's not even fair, because there was a lot of disagreement within the country, but the leadership in the country felt that perhaps that they were able to balance, you know, some freedoms and some normalcy, and they had these death rates uh, that they had, you know, and, and again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I actually, no, it's not true. I, I don't agree with that approach. I will say it's in my opinion, it's wrong, but those are my value judgments. I don't have to impose them on uh, on Sw <laughs> on people from Sweden. Uh, but you know, their their um, their beliefs was that that was the right approach. I don't think it was the right approach. Uh, and you know, my value judgment is that that's an unacceptable high number of deaths that probably could have been prevented. It's it's. I'm glad that you spoke to that because it's been cited in many articles and in many different ways that Sweden has been. Uh, their model has been better, and I, I appreciate I appreciate you speaking to that because there's been a lot of confusion around the various countries, and Sweden has keeps coming up in conversation. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's I think that's amazing that you spoke to that. What do you think about the idea that Health Canada uh, today uh, okayed an antibody test? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, I think they got it right. Uh, we saw what happened in the United States about, I don't know, a month and a half, two months ago. The yes. FDA, the regulatory body of the United States, really relaxed um, some of the regulatory you know, processes and allowed a lot of these antibody tests into the United States. Look what happened. Many of these antibody tests were in the United States. And you know, many of them were of dubious quality. And that was a <laughs> huge problem. And it actually was such a problem that many public health bodies within the United States said, stop. Like, don't use these tests they are not interpretable. Like we don't know what a positive result means. We don't know what a negative result means. And Canada appropriately dragged its heels. We said, you know what? We don't know what's going on. Let's just push pause. Let's wait for a strong horse to emerge. And when one does, we will we'll, we'll give it the green light. And that's what they did. And you know, out of this mess, uh, you know, it looked like a, there's a couple of good tests and, and Canada you know, approved one of them. And I think now we have to figure out at the provincial level, how are these going to be used? What surveillance systems are we going to put in place? How are we going to screen communities? How are we going to look at serology over time, I think is the other interesting thing. And then yeah. at an individual level, are you going to be providing individual counseling based on this? I mean, we can, we can learn a lot because we still don't know if people have recovered from the infection. We're not, we're not sure to what extent people are immune and for how long they're immune for. And those are two big questions that need to be answered. These serologic tests will be 
very helpful tools in answering some of those questions. How long do you see actual testing, not antibody testing, but actual COVID-19 testing go on at the level that, that it is right now? I think we need to scale up. I don't think we're at the level that we need to be. Uh, okay. Certainly, uh, at, you know, we're doing much better across the country, but there should be no, in, in a perfect world, there should be no barriers to diagnostic testing. You know, I think we should scale up on surveillance in different communities uh, and, and screen asymptomatic people periodically just to see if there's, you know, an ember that's glowing, we can catch it before it turns into a flame. I think we should be, and we're doing that in long-term care facilities, but we can expand into the general community, especially other high-risk areas. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I think <laughs> that, uh, you know, people, you still hear stories of people going to COVID-19 testing centers and getting turned away because they don't meet whatever criteria that they have, which is, I think, unacceptable at, as mm -hmm. of, you know, May 13th, 2020. Uh, so we really need to lower the barriers to diagnostic testing and, and scale up. And certainly we've got to find these cases before they, uh, you know, start a chain of transmission in the community and, and set us back. So it's extremely important to, uh, how do we do that? Testing. So a couple of things. One, you need laboratory capacity, which is pretty good in much of the country, but still can be improved. Number two, you need to have the capacity to have rapid turnaround time. You know, it's not acceptable to give someone an answer back, you know, four or five days later. You really want to have rapid turnaround time. And then, of course, you need an army of contact tracers. You really need a lot of people who can not just identify the positive case, but do the contact tracing to look at anyone who had a significant exposure to that case and then support, keyword support people through a 14-day period of isolation. And that way, you know, we would be, you know, better prepared to prevent a second wave of infection. What is it, before I let you go, what is it that you want Canadians or people to know right now about COVID-19 and its spread and how, how we're doing? I think it's important to know that you know, we'd be foolish to think that we have all the answers. I think it's important to parlay that we still need to be patient for a vaccine. Good science takes time. It's going to be faster than most vaccines, I'm guessing, but it's still going to take time. It's okay for public policy to change as it adapts to new knowledge. And as we learn more about this virus and where it's spreading and how it's spreading, it's completely acceptable for senior health leadership to change public health policy to keep up. That doesn't mean people are flipping or flopping. It means they're adapting to new knowledge. That's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's it's important. Uh, and you know, I think if we can do our best to really have reputable sources of information and not politicize this and just really mm -hmm. all look into getting this under control to make sure Canadians are safe, then we'll, we'll be headed in the right direction. I appreciate you speaking with me today. I know how busy you are and how you, busy you've been, and hopefully the next couple of weeks things start to settle a little bit for you. Hopefully, we'll fingers see. crossed. We'll see. Yeah. But I really do appreciate it, Dr. Bogash. Thank you for your time today. Stay healthy. Thank well. you. Thanks for chatting. Have a good one. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.